We all know about Leif Erikson in the Norse discovery of continental America in 1000 AD, and we all know about Christopher Columbus and his discovery in 1492. But the question is, did Columbus, or if we look at the bigger picture, did Europe know about Leif's discovery of the New World? The Lansa Meadows settlement in New Finland is the only archaeological proof we have of the Norse in America, and it is usually regarded as the land where Leif Erikson first stepped foot in the New World, the place he called Vinland. It's also commonly thought that Lansa Meadows was the only Norse settlement in America. We don't know if this is the case, but it would not be a ridiculous presumption to assume they explored vast areas of coastal North America and settled in some of these areas as well. Another mystery is how long the Norse actually stayed in America. According to new radiocarbon data, we know it is possible they stayed for, at most, an entire century at Lansa Meadows. But of course, it could also have been only settled for a few years. I feel it's also important to note that there is an Icelandic document that states that in 1347, a ship had sailed away from Markland, bringing timber with them, and they made their way to Iceland. So Markland is one of the areas Leif Erikson named in the New World. Although now we think Markland is on the coast of Labrador, it is unclear if what these sailors called Markland is the same land that Leif named. After this account, it's very unlikely that there were any inhabited settlements in America. There are a few factors which may have kept the Norse out. One would be possible conflicts with natives, who had their own settlements on the coast. And I think the growing popular theory has to do with climate. Around the year 1000 or 1100, the medieval warm period was ending and the onset of the Little Ice Age began. It would now be more difficult for any settler to survive on land, but it would also be just as much of a struggle to sail through the North Atlantic, which continued to grow colder and colder with ice that became more and more obstructing. A great example of the effects of the Little Ice Age can be seen through the Norse decolonization of Greenland. In the 1350s, the Norse abandoned the western settlement of Greenland. And by the early 1400s, there is no longer any written or archaeological evidence of Norse Greenlanders. So it is not hard to imagine this could have happened to the very few Norse Americans much sooner than the Norse Greenlanders. I mean, just imagine how they thought of this at the time. What was so important to the Norse in this land further west? Somewhere so cold and so far away from Europe? Surely it was not long until many Scandinavians knew about Leif's discovery, but at the time, there probably wasn't anything for them to get too excited about. The settlements of Greenland were isolated, bleak, tiny, scarce, and often unsuccessful. So the Scandinavians probably thought of this as another waste of time. There was more opportunity in parts of Europe, not on some obscure, desolate island. Now, shortly after the discovery by Leif, there is the oldest surviving writing of this Vinland, and surprisingly, it did not come from any of the Nordic countries. Adam of Bremen, a chronicler from Saxony, writes of this land for the first time in 1075, in his book titled, Deeds of the Bishops of Hamburg. In chapter 39, Adam reported on his findings when he was at the Danish court with King Swain Esterson. Adam writes, He also told me that many in this part of the ocean have discovered an island called Vinland, because there are grape vines growing wild which produces the best of wines. From trustworthy Danes rather than from fantastic tales, I also have heard that there is an abundance of cereal which is self-sown. Beyond this island, he, King Swain of Denmark, says, are no more inhabitable islands in the ocean. Everything farther out is covered by immense masses of ice and perennial fog. Mortanus Capella tells of this. One day of sailing beyond Thule, the sea is solid. This, the widely traveled King Harold of Norway found to be true. With his ships, he recently investigated the extent of the Northern Ocean, but finally had to turn back when the extreme limit of the world disappeared in fog before his eyes. He barely escaped the gaping ravine of the abyss. Again, clearly here you can see the mindset of the time. This new finding was hardly relevant, although Adam mentioned some positive features of the land. It was still just some island in the far depths of the world. Many historians point out how Adam of Bremen may have confused the readers of this time. For one, he spells Vinland in Latin, the same way he spells Wendland in Latin. He also confuses what Leif Erikson called Heloland with the northern part of Norway called Helogeland. Adam causes a lot of trouble for future chroniclers and cartographers. 
Around the same time, too, the Icelandic sagas, which occasionally mentioned and detailed the discovery, were being written, but some sagas which mentioned Vinland were not written until the 14th century. And speaking of, in the early 14th century, a geographic encyclopedia called Geographica Universalis was written in Malmesbury, England, and this encyclopedia used the writings of Adam of Bremen as a source, and it placed what it was now calling Windsland or Windland east of Norway. Another mention of the Norse settlement came from an English monk and chronicler by the name of Ranulf Higden from around 1342. Hitchton's book was titled Polychronicon, and he decided to place this windland west of Denmark beside Iceland. And this is where it gets even stranger. I actually had a hard time finding a lot of sources for this, but what I picked up on is that in both of these 14th century sources, they mention that windland's natives can control and sell knotted up wind to sailors so that when they were in a hurry, they could untie the wind, and this would somehow release it and allow their ship to go faster. Thanks to the confusion of the new sources on America, Europe probably did not think much of this land, especially because of the confusion of geography and mythical nature of these past two sources. The only so-called surviving map of pre-Columbian America is the famous Vinland map, which appears to be a map from the 1440s. But something that most people do not know about it is that this map is full of controversies. Too many to cover in this video. To this day, the map is not known to be real or a fraud. But it's definitely something I recommend you do research into. Because if you decipher whether it was real or not, it really says a lot about what Europe knew at the time. But in this video, I'm not going to make any decisive claims about it. So, if Vinland was common or even obscure knowledge in Europe in at least the mid-1300s, if not the mid-1400s, is it possible that Columbus knew about it? Christopher Columbus's son, Ferdinand, wrote a biography about his father, and by the late 1500s it became very popular. In it, he included a short paragraph written by his father himself, which tells of a rather obscure fact about Columbus, at least here in the United States. Columbus mentions a voyage to Iceland. So before I read Columbus's short writing, I need to introduce some context. In May 1476, Columbus would have been a young man, and this is when he took part in a convoy which carried cargo from Genoa to the British Isles. Supposedly he landed in Bristol, England first, and later he went to Galway, Ireland. We know he left Galway in the autumn of 1477, Somewhere in between his arrival in England and his departure from Ireland, Columbus writes about sailing past Thule, which was the name for Iceland at the time. This is the small reference we have to this incident. In the month of February 1477, I sailed 100 leagues beyond the island of Thule, whose southern part is in latitude 73 degrees north and not 63 degrees as some affirm. Nor does it lie upon the meridian where Ptolemy says the west begins, but much further west. And to this island, which is as big as England, the English come with their wares, especially from Bristol. When I was there, the sea was not frozen, but the tides were so great that in some places they rose 26 fathoms and fell as much in depth. Sadly, there is no real consensus on whether this is what really happened or not. There is actually a lot of evidence pointing against this. Many claim that Columbus never went to Iceland, and this is an attempt to lie and brag about his seafaring experience. And if Columbus didn't lie about this, surely it was his son who did. This is the viewpoint of most Italian scholars. The Scandinavian scholars, on the other hand, tend to believe in Columbus's voyage to the Arctic, and that this voyage was specifically to learn about the sagas and the journey of Leif Erikson. This is not impossible, but would be strange especially because there is no written evidence of Columbus actually being on the island, just sailing beyond it. There is also an interesting theory that Scandinavian scholars like to throw around, and I don't mean that in a bad way because it really piqued my interest and, as far as I know, it could make sense. If we assume it is true that Columbus spent time in Iceland to learn of land of the west, it is possible that because of the proximity between Iceland and America is so little, he took advice from Icelanders, and thought that if he was going west, he would hit land at approximately the same place as Leif did, even though his voyage was much further south. 
And if you know much about Columbus, you know that this is true. He did think he could reach Asia much sooner than he did, and he actually prepared for a much shorter voyage than he took. Many also fairly point out that this is the only reference of Columbus ever going to Iceland, or rather, I should say, sailing past it. And later, he even seems to indicate that he's never been there. On his first famous voyage to the New World in 1492, he writes that he has traveled the entire Mediterranean and has traveled as far south as Guinea and as far north as England. If he traveled further north than England, why wouldn't he include this in a letter where he is so obviously bragging about his naval skills? That is the question. So I hope you won't be too disappointed that I don't have an easy direct answer for you. But I wanted to make this video because it bothers me that in school most people don't learn about any of this nuance. Most likely if they're even told about the Viking discovery of America, they are told that Europe has long forgotten about it. And if you'd like, I would appreciate if you would tell me down in the comments if you knew about any of this or not. And if you do know about it, let me know if it was taught in your high school or equivalent if you're in Europe or somewhere else. So if you made it to the end of my video, I'd like to thank you. And I really mean that. I really enjoy making these videos, and I really hope that people enjoy watching them. So if you would like to see some of my future works, or past works, feel free to subscribe and like this video if you liked this video. Thank you.